In the world of entertainment, there are few acts that are the first of their kind, which others are measured by and have successfully entertained their audience for over two decades. So join us as we celebrate with the millions of people around the world who enjoy the Wiggles songs and stories. Everybody clap, everybody sing. <laughs> Wiggles were described by the New York Times as the world's number one preschool group. They're like a phenomenon, aren't they, in the world of entertainment? Their musicality is, is stunning. The production is, is beautiful. They've sold over 23 million videos and DVDs. It, it's like the Beatles have come to town, you know, for these, these kids. I mean, these are their Beatles. They've sold over 7 million CDs and 6 million books. They managed to encapsulate so much of what kids love. Their embrace of musical theatre and a wide variety of musical styles revolutionised preschool entertainment. It's pretty easy to know why the Wiggles have been successful. They're highly talented. They count amongst their fans some of the biggest names in entertainment. Mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes, 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 potatoes. They averaged a million ticket sales per year to their concerts, once selling out 12 shows at Madison Square Garden Theatre. They are so much a part of the zeitgeist that shows such as The West Wing, ER, Scrubs, Arrested Development, Saturday Night Live and numerous motion pictures have referred to or included them. There are Wiggles themed parks and play centres. It truly is a wiggly, wiggly world. This amazing adventure began in suburban Sydney. As young children, the Wiggles all learnt a musical instrument and were encouraged to get involved in music. I was, I was music nerd all, all my life, really, and, and uh, so I think in the back of my mind, I always thought, oh, I wanted. I was kind of playing in a band, and I thought, oh, that's really what I want to do. For Anthony's first Christmas, I bought him a record by the Beatles called "She Loves You," and I used to sing "She Loves You" to him, and he'd sing the chorus of "Yeah, Yeah, Yeah." I was playing in this band called the Roadmasters. Anthony and his brothers would get out of boarding school on the weekends and come and see this. Uh, this rockabilly band with two Asian guys. <laughs> so <laughs> when I first left school, I looked for a job, and the first job I got was working in the fruit department at Woolworths in Borkham Hills. And then I became a soldier with the Royal Australian Regiment. Uh, in between and while they were going on, uh, whenever I could, I was in the Cockroaches rock and roll band with my brother Paul, John, and of course Jeff. I can remember going and seeing the cockroaches, and I'm not exactly sort of a, you know sort of a twinkle toes myself, but moving and, and covered in sweat and thrusting my hands in the air and just thinking this is rock and roll as it was meant to be. Yeah, the cockies had some great years. You know, if you ever had a top ten. Um, hit you have a great year or two where you play to packed houses. 
And it was great for about three or four years, it was just brilliant. Then it started to wear a bit when, you know, the crowd started to taper off a bit. And then we had the personal, deep personal tragedy of Paul's baby dying, which affected us all, especially, of course, Paul. And so that was an emotional death knell for us all, you know, in, in a way. It was an emotional stopping of the fun. It was hard to go back on the road after that. The cockroaches in their twilight years weren't doing a lot, and, and that was the time when Anthony decided to embark on this, um, this uh, preschool teaching course. My sister Colleen was doing a, a test, a mature age test, uh, for the Institute of Early Childhood Studies. I drove the car that dropped her off there, and I just got out of the army. There was nothing to do, and she went in to do the test, and I said, oh, I'll just do the test too. I had no idea what it was all about. I guess after quite a few years in the 80s playing music and um, working in, in the tax office, I wanted to study something, and I thought teaching would be, would be good. I always related well to kids, and um, I think it's a really great profession. It was a fantastic course. As it went on, I learnt all about how children think, uh, child development, child psychology, and the importance of play uh, in, in the children's lives. Murray, Greg and Anthony were good students. Uh, the three of them were strong uh, practically and they were strong theoretically. I, I first met um, Anthony at, at university. I'd finished my first year. Uh, we kind of gravitated together, partly because we were our background in music, but also just because in the course we were doing, there was about um, 500 students, of which 495 were female and the rest, the other five were guys. Having met at university and with music a common ground, Anthony, Murray, Greg and Jeff got together with Anthony's brother, John, to busk. And one of the Wiggles' greatest hits came from this experience. Mr Hot Potato explains. This was a, a circular key while busking and we'd done, we used to do the Four Seasons great song, uh, Ragdoll. And we'd done it 20 times that morning, you know. And I had an idea the day before about a, a call and response song. So I actually said to the boys, I mean, just said, just follow me. So I said, just repeat what I say. And at the time I sang, hot tamale, hot tamale. And they sang hot tamale, hot tamale, hot tamale, hot tamale. I was just making up as I went, and hot tamale, hot tamale, tamale. And then I'd been studying vaudeville music at the time for some reason, and noticed they used to flatten their six chord. So I went, tamale, 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 which is a little bit of vaudeville trickery. And uh, we finished the song and um, it, it rained money. Randy Perry just ran, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like, and so I said, let's try that next time. And again on the Manly Ferry, next time, it, it just, it rained money. It was one of that and Anthony playing the tin whistle and the bagpipes through his nose. And so armed with their knowledge of early childhood education and a developing cachet of songs, this group, without a name, would take their first step towards success when Anthony suggested that they record an album. Well, we were five-piece then. We had Philip Wiltshire, who was a piano player playing with us at the time. And we used to wear different coloured shirts, not, not skivvies, but we wore shirts with very busy patterns. We thought that was kind of bright. Because Anthony in those days would have, and still does, has 2,000 ideas a minute. And this was one of the 2,000 ideas. For me, children's music was a bit of a throwaway thing. I didn't give pay it too much credence. Um, he wanted me to come down to the studio and play on a few tracks and I, and I thought I'd humour him. Their first recording studio was a very interesting little place. It was actually a cupboard. It was as big as a big pantry, a walk-in wardrobe. And they, it had a drum machine in the corner, which Jeff operated. It had a synthesiser. It had even a Fairlight synthesiser in, in the corner, which Jeff operated. And uh, Murray sort of was the engineer and uh, Anthony was ordering everyone around and Greg was there with his golden tomba and they in this tiny 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 studio it was a demo studio for writers that's it they record their first album I mean the, the aim was really just record it and get it released and that was about as far as we thought um, and so we, we did that we didn't have a record deal or anything myself Murray Greg Jeff uh, we're all rock and rollers we could put a a, a bit of music that had a bit of a rock and roll beat and also incorporate what we'd learned about children and, and what they like and what they respond to and that, that was the first Wiggles album. We thought well I guess it's a group we have to have a group name um, and so we had a song called Get Ready to Wiggle and 
Uh, we thought, well, that's kind of the way children dance, just wiggling around, and it's a kind of fun word. So that we decided to call it the Wiggles. Um, get ready to wiggle, wiggle to this song, wiggle to this song. Philip Wiltshire, a classical piano player from Macquarie University, decided that playing live in the group was not for him, and so left the group after only a few shows. The Wiggles have created characters that are as loved as the Wiggles themselves, in some cases even more. Dorothy the Dinosaur is the Wiggles' most popular character. She has spawned three television series that are broadcast in over 80 countries in many different languages. The Dorothy the Dinosaur live show performs to over 110,000 people each year. Dorothy came from a simple observation of what children liked. After 20 years, the Wiggles still remember very clearly where the idea for their most popular character came from. Dorothy came out of uh, Murray's classroom. Murray was teaching and uh, he noticed, like all children, most children anyway, that his children in the class Love dinosaurs. So I wrote this song about finding a dinosaur in your backyard and her name is Dorothy the Dinosaur. We actually used um, the music for that track, which was an old Cockroaches pop song, so we adapted the lyrics to that song. Eating all mum's roses there in the moonlight It was Dorothy the Dinosaur and I know Anthony took the tape along to the preschool he was teaching at and um, gave it to a couple of kids to take home. And um, One parent came back the next day and said, my child played that Dorothy the Dinosaur song, you know, pick a number, you know, 50 times or something. And we kind of went, oh, maybe that's the hit. <laughs> so. Murray provided not only the idea for Dorothy, but her voice and famous giggle as well. Right, you kid! At this early stage of the Wiggles' career, Anthony and Murray were teaching at preschools. The slow transition from teaching to performing involved a litany of knockbacks and bad advice. We really were looking for gigs to play. We were looking for, for venues and uh, someone suggested we see this lady who lives in the eastern suburbs and uh, was a booker for, for children's acts. And um, we went in there and uh, we did you know, hot potato, rock a a bear for her. And apparently she sort of dismisses him. You know, with a step and, say, and, and as he leaves, sort of says, you must know there'll be nothing in it for you and there'll be nothing in it for me. To which the answer is, well, she was half right. We had suggestions from um, TV producers that we should lose the dinosaur, um, that we couldn't t talk to camera, um, we should just sing. At one stage, it was suggested to the Wiggles that they should change their look to be more like youngsters by adding caps and wearing shorts and gym boots. Luckily, this is the only image that exists of that look. The struggles they faced only made them more determined to stick to their guns and trust in themselves. Nobody was doing what we were doing, a group for children playing music. Of course, we were never going to get radio play uh, singing Hot Potato and uh, Dorothy the Dinosaur. What it really meant was that we would fund a lot of things um, ourselves, particularly our, our very first TV, um, TV series. Um, uh, also, it, it, it really threw us back into um, doing what we do best, I, I, I would say, and that's um, touring. Get ready to wiggle. We've been ready for so long. Get ready. To wiggle. I think our first ever gig was um, at a preschool that a friend of ours was teaching at a guy we went to uni with. We, we weren't really sure what we were doing other than we had this experience as teachers so you know I think we just approached it as as a lesson. Very, I was very nervous. I, I had no idea what to expect because I've never been in front of children performing for children before. We were playing to yeah, mostly 10, 15 children in preschools. <laughs> and, uh, and then we did a few parties as well, kids' birthday parties. And it, it was a real grass, grassroots thing. We, we went out there, um, there was the four of us in a van with a trailer on the back, 
um, we did, did it all. We set up the stage with um, the lights, the PA. Um, Jeff used to sell our tapes out of a suitcase after, and later T-shirts as well um, after the show. And, uh, you know, if something went wrong, well, we had to just deal with it ourselves. We did all the characters. I was Captain Feather Sword and Wags the Dog. Murray was Dorothy the Dinosaur. Uh, so it was a six foot four Dorothy the Dinosaur. <laughs> One, two, three. Wake up, Jeff! The wake up Jeff thing came from the... Because I, I didn't have any um, training as a preschool teacher and I couldn't interact with the children um, in that sense, it was a way really of getting me involved on stage uh, without having to actually say anything. One, two, three! Wake up, Jeff! Often in the park, on the seesaw, it's Wake Up Jeff that works because I tend to play with my kids on the seesaw and then fall asleep and then they all scream Wake Up Jeff. And at one point I think I had most of the kids in the park screaming Wake Up Jeff. We weren't in the eye of uh, the media but the, the Bush Telegraph, the children and their parents spoke to each other and for some reason uh, there was a buzz about us and we could go and play shows all around the place and people would turn up knowing who we were. And I think then we started going, well, let's give it a year and see if we can make a living from it. Just because we thought it would be a great fun way to make a living. And um, we, we tried it for a year and we, we never really looked back. The Wiggles wanted to be with the organisation that was synonymous with quality early childhood entertainment. This was the ABC. And the Wiggles knew that being signed by the ABC was a validation of their efforts to date. A new head of ABC Music had just been appointed. Her name was Meryl Gross. Well, Meryl, Meryl really already knew about us because uh, we were signed to Festival Records as the Cockroaches and Meryl worked at Festival Records. At the time, um, children's entertainers were basically solo acts um, performing for children and the ABC had the best of them and they were very successful but I really felt it was probably time for something different and this was what the boys, the Wiggles presented us with. Well when, when we took it to the ABC I, I think um, to an extent uh, we, we, we kind of wrote out a, a really uh, this screed about our philosophy and uh, quite an um, academic kind of treatise really I guess and uh, I think maybe we, we baffled them a little bit and they thought there must be something in this. During the course of the meeting I sat and looked around the table and they were all very very handsome guys and I thought to myself well I think these guys as a band are going to have as much appeal to a three-year-old's mother as they are to the three-year-old. In the early days, the expectations around selling kids records and, and videos was not great. The Australian retailers were not expecting big numbers. In fact, big numbers were 3,000 and 4,000 units. When we got signed to uh, ABC, Meryl Gross uh, was very kind to us, but uh, she said, look, there's not much of a market for what you're doing. You'll be lucky to sell 3,000 copies, but I'll probably think you'll sell about 300. It's just that no one had done this before and therefore she was probably telling the truth and, and probably being right about it, but it exceeded all expectations. In taking those first Wiggles albums and videos to the market, numbers of 60, 70, 100,000 units were achieved in a very short period of time. They redefined the category and took kids' music onto the front page of retailers' catalogues. The Wiggles knew from their background in pop music that nothing helps a song more than a film clip. And so, in an era when Michael Jackson's Thriller clip cost $500,000, the Wiggles' first clip would have a budget of $500. Sitting in the garden and gave me such a fright Eating all mum's roses there in the moonlight It was Dorothy the dinosaur Most of the early videos, probably the first um, three or four, um, with multi-camera shoots and someone was calling them, calling the the, um, the shots, and then whatever whatever we ended up with at the end of the day, that was that was it. Uh, you'll see uh, the sides of sets. You can see people in the background sometimes. Um, sometimes we didn't have the money to complete the whole video, so my hair would be out like this. And then when we finally got the money to finish the video, I'd had a haircut. Again, but it, they were very endearing and 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 this certain charm about them. Hey, stop everybody. We're going off to Dorothy the Dinosaur's birthday party. Yeah! Yeah. Do you want to come with us? 
Come along, we'll march along there. Marching along. But to, to be honest, for children, for young children, do, it doesn't really matter, those early videos, uh, because the heart's there and the communication was there. Our studies told us that children prefer a simple set. They prefer, they're, they're concrete and centred thinkers. It's a struggle because people in the, in the mainstream media would say, why don't you put in this, why don't you put in that? And we actually said, well, because this will communicate better with children. So the fact that the set um, was one that Jeff and Greg just painted themselves didn't make any difference to the children. They still believed it. They still believed in Dorothy the Dinosaur. They still, what they were getting out of it was what we were saying to them and, and what we were singing to them and, and, and the music and the, and the heart and the spirit of it. And, um, and the rest of the trappings are more for the, for the adults. <laughs> After 20 years of performing and having recorded over 700 songs, one Wiggles song stands alone as the most popular. Written by Anthony and Greg, it is Rockabye Your Bear. Hands in the air, rockabye your bear, bears now asleep. Well, I guess the song that stands out most to me from those very early days was Rockabye Your Bear, which seemed to connect enormously with children. Everybody clap. Everybody sing, la 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 la. I love the tune, it's a really sweet song, but also um, Tilly, it was the first thing she kind of responded to on the television in interactively. She started clapping when uh, the guys go, everybody clap, and she, or when she heard the first few bars of the song, she went like this and it was like, oh my God, she's actually, she recognizes the song and she knows what to do. And that was a, a kind of a, a benchmark developmental moment for, for her, you know, and it's got to do with that song, but also the song's really sweet and nice and makes you want to do this. <laughs> it's fascinating to see the simplicity of the songs and the ease with which every child in that audience knows them instantly, you know, that, that the tiny babies can already do the clap clap. Sounds great. And then there's Sanjeev's take. It's funny, it's moving, it's a story, it's got an arc, it's got an historical content to it. I mean, if we can extend our love to a bear, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you clap your hands and sing and, and bow to your partner. I mean, these are all important things that uh, you find in any of the great religious texts. Seeing the popularity of Dorothy the Dinosaur, the Wiggles added more characters to their show. Wags the dog was uh, Anthony's idea. Wags, like all the characters, really comes from the children when you think about it. Children love dogs, non-threatening and happy dogs. There are times when the Wiggles' memories aren't so good. So, Murray, how did Henry the Octopus come about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> There's a funny story about Henry the Octopus. Uh, our drummer in the cockroaches' name was Tony Henry. And one day he came up to Jeff and I and said, why did you name a character after me? Henry the Octopus. I thought it'd be, um, in theory, it'd be great to have a, an octopus that would have eight tentacles that could play the drums <laughs> like that. He thought we were going to say, OK, let's make, name, the, name the character Tony. But we thought Henry's a more fun name, so, uh, and I'm an Anthony anyway. So uh, we went to the piano. We were at uh, Penrith, actually. We were at Joan Sutherland Centre, Jeff and I, and we came up with Henry the Octopus. Henry the Octopus with his underwater school. The funniest and wildest Wiggles character is Captain Feathersword, the friendly pirate. Captain came out of my uh, crazy mind. I was at a birthday party. Uh, we were doing a show and they brought on a pirate after us. The boys in particular really responded to this, this character, but we didn't want a, um, a sort of scary pirate. We wanted a, um, a fairly benign pirate. The scheme of pirates is you have to have a sword, so I said, well, let's make it a feather sword so he only tickles people.
I do like Captain Feathersword. There's something... I love the fact that he's a friendly pirate and, and the fact that he has been... He's disarmed by the fact that his, his, his sword is a, 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 a source of fun, of tickling. So immediately that kind of threatening figure of the pirate is completely lost and you've got this very gregarious, fun guy who's extraordinary sort of force of, of hilarity and his bizarre high voice as well at times <laughs> and his, uh, his, his infectious enthusiasm. I'm a fan, does it show? <laughs> In the original shows, Anthony was Captain Feathersword, and, um, uh, and then eventually Paul Paddock came along. We we needed an extra person. We decided that uh, too, there were too many roles for us to do all ourselves, and so Paul came along. Like his character, Paul Paddock's introduction to the Wiggles was as crazy as the captain himself. I first met the Wiggles. Uh, well, actually, I first met Anthony um, when I was still doing West Side Story with the Victorian State Opera. Uh, the show moved to Sydney and a friend of mine moved in with Anthony as a, a flat, like sharing a flat with him. He had a spare room at the time. I had a hernia and I had to go into hospital and I was going to miss the Wiggles tour. And, and I said to Paddy, mate, would you fill in for me? You've got to be a pirate and um, you've got to be me. I had no idea. I hadn't seen, hadn't seen the show, hadn't seen the other three guys. I hadn't met Greg or Murray or Jeff at that point. We said, oh, when we get there, we'll, we'll take you through everything. And, um, but when we got there, it was kind of pretty late. So we said, oh, tomorrow before we start, we'll give you a quick run through. So basically he had, he had no rehearsal at all. He had, he'd seen the Wiggles once. <laughs> and <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing in the suits at all. Um, it was like, yeah, just come out and wags a song and you, you do this move. This is a wags move. That's, you know, that's all you have to do through the song. And uh, Dorothy goes like this. And Captain Featherstone does this a lot. <laughs> He came back maybe a stone lighter than he was and uh, he loved the experience and the boys said to me, we've got to keep him, he's really funny and he has been brilliant ever since. The Wiggles now had their look, their music and all their characters in place. They were the ABC's biggest selling act on music and video with a new title released every year. Rise, we're ready to wiggle. With a TV show behind them, they toured relentlessly. At one stage, performing an astounding four shows a day, six days a week. It sort of started moving within that first year I was with them from 500 people to about 800 people a show. And, and then, you know, sort of the year after that, it was to 1,000 and, and 1,200. So it really kind of, you know, it doubled in a really short period that couple of years there. In 1998, the Wiggles made the move from small clubs and theatres to arenas, thus becoming one of the country's most successful touring acts across all genres. It's an amazing thing to watch in anyone's career when something happens and you get traction. And I think that's when everybody digs in and knows, with a little bit more effort, this is going to sort of really build. When it seemed the group could not get any bigger, a licensing deal was signed to create a range of consumer products. It's the beginning of what I would say will be 50 million at retail in 1998 uh, on a global basis. The Wiggles would no longer need to sell their merchandise from Jeff's school case. Retail would soon range across musical and plush toys, books, sleepwear, toothbrushes, spaghetti, band-aids, juice, yogurt, and a wide range of apparel. So what was next? A movie. 20th Century Fox released The Wiggles Movie. Produced with local investors, The Wiggles forfeited a performance fee to give the movie the best chance of making a profit. The Wiggles Movie was very popular and the cinemas were full of children who had never seen a movie before. There was only one problem. Cinemas had a policy of not charging for children under the age of three. And that was half the audience going to see the movie. Despite this hurdle, the movie did big business on video and made a profit, a rare thing in the Australian movie industry. By the late 1990s, the Wiggles had grown from a band to a brand that was going global. As the Wiggles took their music to the world, those numbers got bigger and bigger and bigger. The Wiggles were then broadcast in the UK with a new TV series and the USA with film clips on Fox Kids. They followed this up with grassroots tours that they hoped would emulate the success in Australia. 
And then what started as a simple promotion, a performance at Disneyland, caught the attention of executives from Lyric Studios. This would be the launch pad for the Wiggles' initial success in the USA. We received a videotape in the mail and sat down to view it. And I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, they're brilliant. This is fantastic. And she was on her way to go to Disneyland. And there was a, a, an audience of American children mostly that had never seen the Wiggles before and immediately got up and started dancing and interacting with the music. And that's when I knew for sure that we had something that would be really big. This grew, this became a juggernaut that nobody, well, I, I never foresaw as when I joined. And I don't think the guys actually did initially either, you know, and then all of a sudden it became a reality and we were going to America and, and people were loving us. We weren't really chasing success to make a lot of money or to be the biggest thing in the world. We just thought what we were doing was fun and we wanted to keep doing it. The Radio City Music Hall uh, Barney Show sold out in 21 minutes, which was some kind of a record. And 60,000 people attended those shows. And the Wiggles being the Intermission Act were exposed suddenly to a lot of children. Um, we had some products for sale at FAO Schwartz nearby. And two, the two Wiggles DVDs that we had out shot to number one and number two on the Amazon charts. And that really launched our success in America. As the concerts grew, so did the opportunities. The Wiggles were the first ever Australian group asked to perform at the famous Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City, which they did for a record three years. Oi there, me hearties, from the Jolly Polly Bar at you. <laughs> that was quite a surreal experience to be um, travelling down Broadway on a float in zero degrees. <laughs> we really got a sense of um, who the parents were in the audience because um, a lot of cops, a lot of New York cops, obviously family people, lots of them knew who we were. <laughs> My son loves you guys. My daughter loves you guys. <laughs> the world changed when New York City was attacked in September 2001. It was a time of grief and uncertainty. But the Wiggles returned to perform and attend the parade. It wasn't just after 9-11 that there were performers who were shy of going to New York. I can remember Faith Hill, the country singer, cancelled a promotional visit to Australia because she thought it was too dangerous. I mean, people got, you know, very sort of antsy about, you know, sort of going, going anywhere. Actually, when we did the Macy's Day Parade, we asked our cast uh, if anyone had any problem, you know, worried about security, because it was really, really a bit scary. Uh, you don't have to go on the parade, but everybody did. It was incredibly moving. Um, it was, it was almost like a, an act of, not defiance, but uh, like a statement of New York's bravery. I guess that uh, they weren't going to be um, put down by what, what had happened. I'll never forget the emotion, and the feeling of, um, you know, this has happened to us, but we're all together. I'm going to work through this. That everybody had it was an incredible community spirit. Like the rest of the world, the Wiggles had seen news of the suffering that many had endured. They also got to meet firsthand a family who had lost one of their own. Brian was, had so much zest for life. He taught me how to live life, how to love. Brian was the love of my life. Uh, and I, I, my life just feels so empty now, it really does. I... Brian Canizaro was a loving son, husband and father who delighted in watching the Wiggles with his family. At the time, the house that we lived in, when you walked in, you were instantly in the living room, which had the TV, and that was where we spent most of our, our time. So naturally on the TV, the images of the planes crashing into the towers would just replay over and over. I had, you know, a son, 10 and a half months at this time, that I would absolutely, you know, I had to protect him from these images. And the only way that I could think of doing that in those days was to have the Wiggles on. And they were. They were on in my house 24-7. He didn't realize Brian was gone and everything. Like, I mean, he, you know, he didn't, he, too young, you know what I'm saying? He, he was too young. But this, the, the, the Wiggles just put him in such a, a great frame of mind. He was just happy. He was, he was, he was, he was laughing all the time. Uh, we got a few emails, not a few, quite a few emails uh, from New York from people saying our children 
all they see is is the images of the planes flying into the buildings, or the terrible uh, tragedy, and uh, they put the wiggles on, and it's and it's a relief from that. Please come over. A very close friend of mine um, found out that the Wiggles would be playing in New London, Connecticut. He contacted somebody um, in the Wiggles office and I guess told the story that we were watching the Wiggles all the time and how in many ways the Wiggles um, were just, you know, sunshine in a time of horrendous darkness. We went and met, met her after the show and uh, we became very close friends and heard about Brian and other firefighters. I guess their story just really touched us because it made it a really human thing. You know, to, to, it was upsetting enough to watch it unfold on the on the day, but to then meet someone who had been you know, devastated so so personally by it um, was incredibly moving. We actually had a benefit concert at the fire station uh, for the firefighters and for the children. They took all the children, all the people, all the neighbors. It was such a great family affair event and just gave back to that firehouse. I mean, it was great. It's great for the soul. It was great great for us too, I think, to, um, to meet these people and hear the sad stories, but uplifting stories as well and the fact that they were moving forward with their lives. We presented the Wiggles with uh, a cross from the World Trade Center, from the steel from the World Trade Center uh, so that they would have a piece of this moment in history that um, they certainly helped us get through. After dedicating Wiggly Safari to the memory of Brian, the Wiggles flew members of the Canizaro family out to Australia for a healing holiday. For, for someone, the strangers to, you know, to, to give a part of themselves away the Wiggles did is, it's incredible. The Wiggles would return to New York many times and the city embraced its Aussie sons. The Wiggles set a record when they played 12 consecutive shows at Madison Square Garden Theatre. Just playing Madison Square Garden was a buzz in itself. Being in New York is just the greatest thrill. What I love was the fact that the Strokes were then the biggest band in America. They were on the, the front cover of Rolling Stone. We got there and the Strokes were moving out after their run of gigs, which was one. <laughs> the Wiggles were moving in to do their run of shows, which was 12. That's one of those things that when you look back on, think, wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, when we, when we first recorded that album, you know, 1991, we had no thought that we'd ever probably visit Madison Square Garden, let alone do, do that. Incredible as it may sound, it's now on the uh, Trivial Pursuits game in America, who sold out uh, 12 shows. You know, it's got The Who, The Rolling Stones, The Wiggles and someone else, you know. In 2004, they travelled 4,000 miles, performing 150 shows in 97 days across 50 cities. This amount of touring takes its toll on a group and the individual members. After 15 years on the road, one of the Wiggles could no longer continue. Greg Page had decided that he would have to leave the Wiggles and pre-recorded an emotional farewell message. For some time now, I've been suffering from a condition which I've recently found out is chronic. It's a condition called orthostatic intolerance, which basically means that when I stand up, my heart doesn't pump enough blood around my body. Now, it's not a life-threatening condition by any means, but it is one that's going to be with me for the rest of my life, and it will mean that I have to make some changes to my life in order to manage it. For, for, for a while um, before Greg left, it was kind of clear that um, he wasn't 100%, he wasn't totally well. Well, Greg's illness would manifest itself in, in that he would have uh, fainting spells. He couldn't handle a lot of the flash bulbs and he couldn't handle a lot of all the people surrounding him because it was literally making him sick. And I got so concerned, I was like, you need to go see a doctor, you need to figure out what's going on. But he never wanted to do it because he never wanted to miss a show. We noticed it more and more as we went on. Uh, he'd be at a meet and greet, meeting children and he'd faint or maybe 30 seconds before we went on stage, he'd collapse and uh, I think Sam, filled in for him nearly 200 times. 
Uh, there was times where he would run off stage in, you know, midway through a song and, and indicate for me to take over because he had to take a break. Um, There's also times where the overture was playing and he realised he, could, he realised he couldn't go on and, and I had to quickly <laughs> put the yellow skivvy on and run out there and, and start the show. There was an obvious point where it started occurring too much for him to go on doing the lifestyle that we li lived. And you know that's it's sad. It was a very sad time, um, for lots of reasons. I mean, the four of us had gone so far together, and um, and we were friends. We're, and we you know we still are. And but yeah, I do miss Greg um, in the in the group and on the road. And uh, and I know a lot of other people do too. If proof was ever needed to show the success of the Wiggles, news of Greg's departure was reported worldwide. You know, the fact that uh, it was reported on the front of the New York Times that, uh, you know, Greg had left the Wiggles was, um, you know, that wouldn't happen to any other band in Australia, any other band in the world, I can't think of that actually making the front page. The changing of a, a member in a major act is always going to be fraught with some, with some difficulties. It seems to me that, uh, well, ACDC pulled it off incredibly, incredibly well by, by necessity. I mean, over the years, the Doobie Brothers and there's been a few other acts have done it. But, you know, it can just, just as easily fall as well. Murray, myself and Jeff, after Greg left, decided to keep going. And we could have uh, retired as well, but we still enjoy it. We still feel like we can still entertain children and families. Fortunately, there being four really creative people meant that it, it wasn't the only creative part had left. And the fact that Sam had been working with us for a long time made the transition easier as well because he, he understood the, the process as well. He understood the, the ethics of, of the early childhood training and all that stuff because he'd been a long time worker with us. I became Greg's understudy about five years before um, taking over the Yellow Eagle. Um, I just finished a job in IT actually and Anthony had asked me to come do some recording and then Greg was scheduled to have a knee operation I think and couldn't do a tour. So they asked me to fill in for that tour and then they, I think they realised after those two, that two week tour they needed somebody to be able to fill in for Greg whenever he was sick. Right now I'm going to officially hand over the yellow skivvy to the new yellow wiggle, Sam Moran. Thanks Greg. Sam is so talented when it comes to singing and dancing and really getting the audience on their feet with his voice. I do remember the day I was asked to become the Yellow Wiggle full time. Anthony came and and spoke to me and my wife Lynn was on the tour at the, on the road at the time so sat us down and, and said the show had been feeling really comfortable with me in that role and that they'd like me to continue doing it full time. There was a, certainly a nervousness about the transition um, but I think that because the communication with the audience was so well executed that it was presented to the kids and to the fans uh, that the handover was very public. Once. Sam moved in and took over for Greg, it was very smooth because everybody realized it is about red, purple, yellow, blue, and it is preschool, and it is the music, and they are the characters. So it was very successful the way they transitioned from Greg through Sam. The Wiggles introduced a fresh new look with their television and videos, and audiences loved what they saw. Since the transition, the Wiggles have continued their success winning the ARIA for Best Children's Album for the last four years. Just as the Wiggles have extended their TV broadcast into over 100 countries... Hola a todos, somos the Wiggles! Hi, 大家好,我们是 The Wiggles! Their touring boundaries have also been extended, so that in one year, the Wiggles toured Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Dubai, Ireland, the UK, USA and Canada. Over the years, the Wiggles have got to meet and in some cases work with an amazing array of celebrities. The celebrities for the Wiggles came out of the woodwork. We had them lined up in every city we went to. Matthew Broderick, Sarah Jessica Parker and 
uh, Jerry Seinfeld. It's good to be a wiggle. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in New York, you look out through the curtains and there was like, you know, Cindy, Cindy Crawford. And, and of course, there are the tales of, you know, sort of Fogarty and Seinfeld and all, all that stuff. Working with John Fogarty was one of those moments. Uh, I grew up loving Credence and John Fogarty solo music. To actually work with him was a dream come true. His daughter loved the Wiggles and that's how it came about. Uh, when we recorded with him, we went over to his studio and we spoke to him about rock and roll and about music for about an hour. And I wish I'd taped it because he was just being candid about who he loved, what he loved about rock and roll. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. Robert is coming to the show, to the three o'clock show. Wow! Are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> talking to me? We actually had to hold up the show for um, for Robert De Niro because he was running late. We could see De Niro. He was like up near the front and, and uh, was a little bit like that scene from um, Cape Fear, sitting there eating popcorn. <laughs> Shaq came to a few shows, uh, got his own red skivvy made, and for a surprise, uh, got up on stage with us. His manager of side stage went, Shaq wants on. But ESPN ran a story because Shaq was out of the team at the, at the time, injured, and the headlines were Shaq can't be that injured, he's on stage with the Wiggles, and they showed him singing Hot Potato with a guitar. John Travolta um, announcing that he wanted to go and you know, he, he wanted to meet meet the Wiggles and just why would he want to meet us sort of thing. Came in singing Hot Potato <laughs> and doing the actions and then I put my head out to shake his hand and he said oh that's not enough and, and hugged us all and I must admit in the back of my mind I'm thinking this is really strange John Travolta is hugging me. Wilco is on stage and um, I will I will forego the ex the expletive but he said is that you Murray. Yeah, James Hetfield from Metallica was another amazing one. We met him in San Francisco where he lives and, and uh, we started playing Enter Sandman, Metallica song, but singing a quack, quack, quack to it. And uh, we looked down and James Hetfield stood up and, and <laughs> it was fantastic. Then I spoke to Duff from Guns N' Roses who said, uh, look, before we start talking about the uh, girls and the rock and roll, you don't know the wiggles, do you, mate? Chris Martin, was, that was great. I, I think on one of the earlier tours we went there, but he actually did mention the Wiggles. But halfway through the show, he sang Fruit Salad. He knew the Wiggles were in the audience and he sang Fruit Salad and dedicated to us. Yummy, yummy, fruit salad. I'm sorry the name drop, but uh, I then kind of contacted Hugh Jackman, uh, who's a friend of mine and national Australian treasure, and said, so you're from Australia, do you know anything about these guys, the Wiggles? And he kind of emailed me back and said, the Wiggles, are you kidding? They're amazing. You've got to go and see them. Uh, I wish I was a Wiggle. Well, I, I met them in Florida. They were doing a, a, a brief show out there, uh, out in the theme park. And I saw them and was just like, wow, you know, lo love to meet you guys. I went up and they handed me a belt. It was like an honorary Wiggle. So I have the Wiggle belt. Yes, I do. It was the first year of Scrubs and we had started on TV in September and the, sh the show was going pretty well. And so we were invited to New York City to go to the Thanksgiving parade. And I looked behind us, and who's there but the big red car? And I knew the Wiggles. They didn't know me, but I knew the Wiggles. And I got off the float, and I walked back about 50 yards, and I introduced myself to everybody. And it made the whole trip. And I got back here, and I told Max that I had met the Wiggles. He didn't believe me. And uh, I stayed in touch with the guys from 2001 on. And the conclusion you draw is, well, in the end, we're all parents, <laughs> or we're all uncles or aunts or we're whatever. While meeting so many celebrities, the Wiggles have never seen themselves in the same light. I can remember once being at the Metro Theatre, the big rock venue in Sydney, and we'd just seen Sonic Youth. I bump into Murray in the bar of the Metro. We're talking about this incredible gig. Then you start seeing all the really cool, hip Sonic Youth fans. The ones in their sort of late teens, early 20s, walking out going, great gig, man, yeah, you want to go partying? Hey, there's Adam Spencer, Triple J, oh yeah, there's the guy from the Wiggles. What? Murray, rock on! 
The Wiggles have been recognised for having entertained and educated millions of children around the world. With honorary doctorates from the Australian Catholic University, Macquarie University and the Outstanding Achievement Award from ARIA. When we started out 12 years ago, we had no idea we'd be here on the stage. We were just a bunch of teachers. <laughs> Their recognition is international as well. The city of New York has recognised them for the great work they did post 9-11. The state of Louisiana has recognised their commitment to education and entertainment. But particularly getting it from Macquarie University is, is amazing because that's, that's where we started. We, um, we couldn't have done it without the study we did there. To be given an honour like that, um, it was very moving and, and um, um, you know, a really proud moment. The Order of Australia was the most mind-blowing and uh, hopefully my grandkids will, will, will be proud of their grandpa. I haven't got grandkids yet, by the way. <laughs> Even if I look like I do. President Kennedy once said, to those who much is given, much is expected. In this spirit of noblesse oblige, the Wiggles have been active in supporting numerous charities throughout their career. They've visited literally hundreds of homes and hospitals and schools to help out kids and families who are in a, often a desperate state, children in particular who are very sick. And often a visit by the Wiggles or one of the Wiggles has been the only bright, bright point in, in the, the lives of those kids and families. We get to meet children with disabilities um, or who are sick uh, before we do our, our shows, our, our concerts. Children who've passed away uh, that we've met and for a little moment we had some connection with and uh, made, made them smile or they made us cry, you know, after we met them. When you as an, an adult go to the show and a Make-A-Wish uh, child is brought up on stage and the integrity that the Wiggles, each guy treats that child with, whether it's backstage or up on the stage, you can A, feel it as an adult and the kids know too. Um, never mind their musicality is, is stunning, the production is, is beautiful. The, what, what really resonates uh, at a profound level is their sense of integrity. They also did a concert for UNICEF where five villages in East Timor, they arranged that uh, fresh water supplies were sent up to those villages. Wake up, Jeff, before the day is through. The Wiggles were honoured to be asked to be goodwill ambassadors for UNICEF and approached Kylie Minogue to record a song together and donate the performance royalties to UNICEF. The thing about the Wiggles, I think, is they do so much great work behind the scenes that go unreported, all, all power to them. Great guys, beautiful, beautiful hearts. In recent years, the Wiggles have gone on to create new shows using the expertise of their production house. Dorothy the Dinosaur, Baby Antonio's Circus and the Kingdom of Paramithi. So how much longer can the Wiggles continue? Um, I don't know. We, we have always said that we will keep doing this for as long as we enjoy it and um, we are still really enjoying it. It's one of those things we sometimes talk about but we never, there's never a definitive answer, I don't think. Um, it's usually, it's, it's, it's actually the way we've done a lot of things. It's, let's just see what happens. Well, I hope when uh, the day comes when we can't wiggle anymore, you know, uh, we, we pass the baton on to, um, to uh, younger wiggles. Children don't discriminate, though, about young or old. They don't care about grey hair, expanding waistlines. They just want to be entertained. So it doesn't really matter who we pass the batons on to or the skivvies on to as long as they entertain. It can be girls, boys, uh, doesn't matter. Although I must say, my little boy Antonio really wants the blue skivvy when he grows up. It's the big red car! It's the big red car! We travel here and we travel far! It's the big red car! We're going to ride the whole day long! Everyone say hi to Murray! 23 million videos and DVDs and 7 million albums. 30 million units over 20 years. I think the Wiggles have been so successful because of their unique combination of colour, energy and they're just damn good fun. They don't talk down to kids. Uh, they're their friends, they sing, they dance, uh, they speak their language. I think the overall overriding factor of the whole thing is that they don't patronise children. You got the feeling that it wasn't sort of, we are these adults in charge and we are, you know, we are doing something for you and you will, you will enjoy it. It was more about, hey, 
Let's have a let's have a let's have a good time. I think you'll like this. At the heart of what they do, there's a great sense of fun, of colour, of physical activity, of, of health, of all these things that it's really important to instill in children. Each one of the songs seems to be like a little lesson in life, you know, for really young kids. In all people I've met in all different fields, great athletes, great actors, great musicians, great thinkers, tend to make really difficult things look quite easy. You watch The Wiggles, for you, a few minutes to yourself, you think, I could write a song like that. I, I could actually, I mean, a few mates could do that. Try it. The great thing about The Wiggles is, yeah, OK, they had all, they knew they were doing it for children, but what drove them mostly is that, is what drove the cockroaches when you, when you think about it. Good time rock and roll, the pure, exhilarating joy. Kids love music and they're a band for kids. I mean, it seems it's strange that there isn't an entire culture of bands for children. And then there's Sanjeev's take. I think also that, and they are very well connected with some very, very dodgy people who have dirt on everybody. I mean, absolutely everyone around the world. I mean, from De Niro to, to me. And, you know, at a moment's notice, they just need to press the button and that will just hit the press. And so, once again, I'm legally obliged to say that they are amazing and brilliant just to protect my own backside. <laughs> and let's wave goodbye to each other. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. I think that um, the Wiggles now are miles apart from... I don't think there's any way to compare any, anyone with them, but quite frankly, I think what will happen is that as they came along as a band in a time when they're normally only solo performers, something else will come along, um, but it will be totally different, but the Wiggles will always rule. Who knows what the future holds for the Wiggles? No one thought that Anthony's idea to create children's music would last longer than one album. In famous last words, when Anthony asked Jeff to join him in the studio, Jeff said, how long will this take? Who knows, Jeff? <laughs> everywhere. Tell us about it, Sam. Tell us about it. What happened on your holiday? I was walking in the park one day. I was on my holiday. I turned around and what did I see? There was a monkey swinging in a tree. About the monkeys. What happened next? I kept walking through the park when I thought I heard a laugh. I turned around and what did I see? A little bird sitting in a tree singing.